Uh, Cornelia Cotton is a writer with a long interest in local history. She has written They Lived in Croton, an archive of Croton's visual artists, Stepping Stones, an autobiography, which you can order on Amazon, and has given talks on Mount Airy history and the old Croton aqueduct. Please join me in welcoming one of Croton's outstanding women, Cornelia Cotton. <laughs> I'm wired. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Can you hear me? A little louder, like this? Yes. Right in the mouth. Right OK. <laughs> I would like to thank the Friends of History to invite me once again and to continue my investigations into outstanding Croton women in honor of Women's History Month. That's how it all started. And uh, last year was uh, the first talk, and uh, it was quite well received, and that's why they asked me to do 10 more outstanding women. <clears throat> and uh, that was easy, because there are many outstanding women in Croton's past at present, but I've sort of uh, stuck to the past because you can tell more anecdotes about people that are no longer around. <laughs> <laughs> they, they can't correct you. Um, I would like to uh, thank Mark, who designed the beautiful flyer, which you've probably seen, and um, Jim Christensen, who helped me with the visual aspect of all of this, which I don't understand. Now, I was supposed to have a clicker and move pictures forward, and I was looking forward to that. But wouldn't you know, tonight it doesn't work. So uh, I have to ask Mark to, uh, I have to say next, and then he will advance the picture. Uh, a special thank you goes to Tom Simone of the Croton Historical Society. He isn't here, he's in Bali. But he uh, did an enormous amount <coughs> of research uh, to help me along. And I, I couldn't do it without him. Now, continuing where I left off. Uh, last year, I started my talk with a woman who never lived in Croton, although she left a tremendous imprint on our village, and that was Isadora Duncan. It was really her sister, Elizabeth, who did live here. But of course, we're all totally in love with Isadora, so the first picture last year was of Isadora. Now, this year, same thing. This is Lillian Nordica, once a very famous, glamorous opera star. As a matter of fact, people believe that she was the greatest opera singer ever in the history of this country. She also did not live in court, <laughs> but almost. <coughs> And had she lived in Croton, our village would be completely changed. It would not be what it is today. And we will come to that in a minute. Lillian Nordica uh, hailed, as so many famous people do, from a tiny little village. In Maine, she came from, Farmington, Maine. The house in which she grew up is now a little museum. She early showed her talent for singing and studied at the New England Conservatory of Music in Boston and then went to Europe. She studied for two years only in Europe. And then she got all these roles. She was in every 
Opera House in Europe, a tremendous sensation. Uh, it was hard to believe how fast she rose like a meteor, so to speak. But she was also very ambitious, and she studied up on Wagner. And this is the amazing thing. She gave the first performance ever of Elsa in Lohengrin at Bayreuth at the Festspielhaus after it had been composed. Wagner was still alive. From then on, she became famous as an interpreter of Wagner's opera roles. And I think we see one or two pictures of her in those uh, outfits. I think that's Elsa. Next. Uh, brilliant. <laughs> uh, she was nor enormously successful and made millions of dollars. Right. Yes. <laughs> and you can see she was very glamorous as well. She was a very determined, independent, steadfast person, fearless. And once when uh, a fire started uh, in Göttingen, where the extras are holding torches, and one of these torches uh, started a fire, she went right to it and stamped it out with her feet and burned her uh, boots. But that was Nordica. She then uh, came back to the United States, where she was feted at, at, to sang at the Met and made a tour or several <coughs> tours uh, crisscrossing the United States. She had her own railroad car called Isolde. Her fame was such that uh, she was advertising Coca-Cola. <laughs> Now, uh, with all of this fame and great music making, uh, her private life was a disaster. She was married three times. The first time to a Hungarian balloonist. <laughs> and he disappeared in <laughs> balloon over the English Channel. Uh, the next one was a gigolo, and then the third one was a wealthy Wall Street uh, a tycoon, I guess, and uh, of course, as soon as they were married, he lost all his money on the stock market, and then he went through all of her money. And this had very tragic consequences in the long run. I should say that she was a fiery advocate for women's rights and women's votes. And now, when she was 50, she met Colonel Harmon. We've just heard about him. He played such a great role in our community. And it clicked. Now, exactly what their relationship was, I don't know. But they saw in each other being able to realize uh, lifelong goals. She wanted to create a, an American Bayreuth with a festival house and all the things that go with it, students, dormitories, and create a whole an opera city right here in Harmon, where he had just bought all that land from the Van Cortlands. It was just there. It, it was a tremendously exciting idea for both of them. She wanted to do it, he wanted to do it, as you know, and he wanted to bring up a whole lot of people from the city to be there. They wanted to be there where all these artists were. And he chartered, you know, railroad uh, uh, trains came up from the city bringing people up here, you know, by the carload. And, and some artists actually did settle here, but uh, somehow he couldn't raise the money 
for such a huge venture. She went to Europe to try to raise money from wealthy uh, opera lovers over there, and she couldn't do that either. So the whole thing petered out, and, and that's why I said, had she lived, <laughs> and had they done this, Croton would look very different today. Now, because this third husband uh, ruined her financially, she made an ill-advised world trip to uh, raise money for herself. As she was older and very, very taxing. She left from San Francisco, she got to Australia, and after performing there, she had a collapse. Then she got on the boat to go to Batavia, then the Dutch East Indies. The ship foundered, it was shipwrecked, and Lillian Nordica died of exposure in Batavia. Now, isn't that an opera libretto if you ever heard one? It's, it's fascinating, but it, it's sad. It gets sadder. Um, my late husband, Bill Cotton, loved Beethoven. He was crazy about Beethoven. So we had to go to the Met to hear Fidelio. And we got there early, and we had time on our hands, so we walked along all the corridors in the Met to look at the pictures of all the singers and conductors. And there are lots of those exhibits. And we kept going, we still had time. We went downstairs, there was another corridor. And then there was another one, and it was the basement of the Met. There were no people there, it wasn't lit all that well. We were all by ourselves. And all of a sudden, I saw this life-size oil painting of Lillian Nordica in, in a corner. I stopped in my tracks. It really, you know, look at this fantastic woman who had the world at her feet. And all that's left is a portrait in the basement of the Met and the street in Croton. <laughs> this is the house that Colonel Harmon built for her, but she never lived there. It still stands. It's 11 Alexander Lane. A beautiful little house was to be hers. And uh, at a later time, Elizabeth Duncan's uh, little students danced on that lawn. Crystal Eastman. Um, if you have heard of her at all, it would be as the sister of Max Eastman. Max Eastman may mean something to some of you, but he had this wonderful sister who was equally fervent and radical and pacifist and socialist and activist. Of course, uh, Max, he was irresistible. And he was, of course, the lover of many women. And he was mesmerizing. He could get anybody to do anything for him. And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, he, there were friends in Croton who summered on Martha's Vineyard, and they saw him on the nude beach with a whole group of women following him. <laughs> That's how attractive he was, beautiful. Life. Now, uh, Crystal was much more earnest. And uh, 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 let's see another picture of her. Uh, here she is. Uh, it's a snapshot. We'll come to that. Uh, she, we should know more about her because she was a very influential labor lawyer and the founding of several organizations that have lasted to this day. Um, 
she was a writer, editor, and uh, she was beautiful, tall, six foot, athletic, very forward looking, bobbed her hair and wore shorter skirts to get around better, very modern in every way. Um, she uh, was quite, quite uh, brilliant. Went to Vassar and then studied uh, sociology at Columbia and got her law degree at NYU. As a very young person, and she may have still been a student, she wrote her first important work, and it was called Work Accidents and the law. And this was so important, it led to the first New York State Workers' Compensation Law. There wasn't anything like that ever before, if you got hurt on the job, it was tough luck. <laughs> but this law, which she wrote about, was then adopted by all the other states, that makes her a very, very important in the history of uh, labor. Uh, she married and divorced, refused alimony, saying women can take care of themselves. <laughs> uh, she led the suffrage mo uh, movement in New York, was very outspoken, very courageous, a magnificent orator, spellbinding. Um, by 1911, uh, the we uh, many Western states, California, Oregon, Washington, Arizona, and a few others, had begun to give women the vote. It went state by state. But uh, Crystal and the other suffragists felt that it, it would be better to have a federal law. They founded the National Women's Party, uh, which existed for a long time and, and concerned itself with women's issues. Uh, then World War I broke out. She was vehemently against US entry in the war. We have to remember uh, at that time, uh, Germans were the largest immigrant group in this country. She campaigned against the draft against profiteering in arms production. Now, during the war, World War I, and I think in every war, there always, the government always tries to <coughs> stifle dissent. And that was especially so in World War I. And she led a campaign to protect free speech, rights of assembly, and the rights of conscious objectors. That was something new. This was the beginning of the American Civil Liberties Union, which she founded with Roger Baldwin and Norman Thomas. Very important. I'm a member. And I hope you all are too. Now, you may recall <coughs> that her brother, Max, uh, started a wonderful magazine, Masses, of it, which he was the uh, chief editor and uh, played a big role in the intellectual life of our country at that time. It was socialist, it was pacifist, it, 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 it uh, you know, incorporated all the socialist ideas of that time and uh, when America entered the war in 1917, the government did everything uh, to squelch it. And they managed that by uh, withholding mailing privileges from it, so you couldn't mail it anymore. So that was the end of masses. But uh, the war was over a year later, and Max started a new magazine with Crystal. Max lived at the top of Mount Airy in what we know as the Salzburg House, 
She lived at 79 Mount Airy. And she became the co-editor. Max said she really did all the work. She was a wonderful writer. Uh, I read up on some of the articles in uh, the new magazine that they founded, Liberator, which lasted till about 1923. Meanwhile, she had married again a very gentle uh, poet, uh, pacifist, uh, Walter Fuller, who was uh, the brother of the Fuller sisters, if you've heard of them. They were a very charming group of sisters who sang English folk songs and accompanied themselves on the Irish heart. Uh, they toured here in America, and that's where he met. He was their manager, and that's where he met Crystal. They had two children, and tragically, in 1928, uh, he died suddenly, and then 10 months later, she died of a disease she had all her life, but it came to the fore, and left her children orphans. Uh, Crystal Eastman uh, had been forgotten for 50 years. But in 2000, in 2000, she was finally inducted into the uh, Hall of Fame at Seneca Falls, which honors our uh, women who struggled for women's rights and women's votes. Of course, the original uh, meeting was in 1848. And uh, there were women as well as men at a time when women were not allowed to speak in public, actually, but they did there. And most of them were abolitionists. This was for the Civil War. Needless to say, none of the people of that original group lived long enough to see the 19th Amendment passed in 1919, which gave women the right to vote. And I'm always struck by the fact that these people struggled, they suffered, they went to jail, they were beaten up, uh, they made many sacrifices to get the vote, and then today not everybody votes. <laughs> and it's really a shame. Well, let's see who's next. Oh, this is a, a, the first issue of The Liberator. Uh, and you see John Reed has a story in it. We'll come to him in a moment. <laughs> now we're coming to a really gorgeous, beautiful woman, Louise Bryant. And there are people who do know about her as John Reed's wife or Jack, as he was called. She was absolutely stunning. This is a picture of her as a very young woman. She grew up in the desert in Nevada and then went to San Francisco, where she got a job in a cannery. And she was appalled at the living and working conditions of the workers. And that radicalized her. She uh, wanted to be a writer. She wanted to become an activist. She went to college, University of, of Nevada and Oregon, married, and uh, published her first pieces in uh, the Oregon, the, uh, the local uh, newspapers there. And wouldn't you know it, uh, Jack Reed came through, and, and well, that was the end of that. She was gorgeous and irresistible, and so was he. And they ran off together to New York. <laughs> Let's see the next picture. Mark? Yeah. She had a, a wonderful looks. Next. There they are. Uh, at first, 
they lived the bohemian life in Greenwich Village and Provincetown. They had many affairs uh, with other people, Eugene O'Neill, and Lord knows what their whole list people make. But then they settled in Croton, uh, in the little house on Mount Airy Road that has some fence around it, just before Georgia Lane. Uh, he bought it from Mabel Dodge, uh, who had been his lover before he met Louise. <coughs> and they were married in, in 1916. But the next year, the Russian Revolution broke out and they decided to go there and be witnesses and uh, participants. And they did go. And as you know, uh, when they came back, uh, Jack wrote his famous book, Ten Days That Shook the World, in that little house. <clears throat> and Louise also wrote uh, two books. Uh, one was called Six Red Months in Russia, and the other was uh, Mirror of Moscow. And she interviewed all the leading new people, you know, uh, Trotsky and... and uh, uh, all the other leaders of the new government there. But as, as you undoubtedly know, uh, after finishing his book, he wanted to go back. He wanted to witness the beginning of a new kind of state, the Soviet state. He went and got sick with typhus and died. Um, and it was a, a major uh, tragedy. Next. You know, uh, uh, Jack, Jack Reed was very famous in Soviet Russia. Every child knew about him and his story. They idolized him. He was an American who had joined their side. And uh, when uh, Warren Beatty was in Russia once and he had an affair with the great ballerina Maya Przezetskaya. She asked him, please tell me about John Reed. And he said, who? Because Americans don't know about him, but in Russia everybody knows about him. So he decided to look into it and out of that came the movie Rats, which tells the story of Jack Reed and Louise Bryan, and that was uh, Diane Keaton. And they came to Croton and looked at the house, and they were around, and my husband was in the diner, room and they had something to eat there. <laughs> and uh, he wasn't easily impressed. He asked the waitress, what are they eating? And she said, the same as you. So, uh, <laughs> uh, but they didn't use the little house. Uh, they couldn't because there were people living in it. It was too difficult. They built a little replica in England where the movie was uh, made. Next. Now there you see how uh, elegant and uh, beautiful she was. And, uh, and a very good writer. Uh, I uh, have one of her books. It's right there. You can look at it. Uh, Elegant style, colorful, a, a good journalist. Next. She was so pretty. Next. This is at the casket of John Reed in Moscow. It was very moving. There were long lines of people trying to pay their last respects. They said, he, is one, he was one of us, is what they said. He was buried in the Kremlin wall, the only foreigner. She then came back and tried to interest Hollywood in his book, Ten Days That Shook the World. She was not successful, but uh, she met a man uh, there who was crazy about her and pursued her and she finally married him. He was uh, 
William Bullitt, a wealthy a guy who had political ambitions. He wanted to um, rise in the, in the government, and he did eventually became ambassador to Russia and ambassador to France later on, uh, just before World War II. The rest of the story is also kind of a sad decline. She had a child with Bullet, a little girl, but the marriage found it quickly. Uh, he accused her of uh, uh, having affairs with others and being a lesbian and all that kind of thing. And, and he, uh, uh, there was a terrible divorce and he got custody of the child. She never saw her child again. He took it away from her. And this caused her a very intense grief. She also suffered from a, an incurable disease. She also drank a lot. And so she went downhill until she died penniless in uh, Paris. A sad story. However, um, let's see. I copied this out. <clears throat> Oh, before this, I should say, uh, communist historians have been dismissive, dismissive of her. Uh, and they say she has no proper place in, in the history of radicalism or communism in America. And uh, that, that's really not true. And Emma Goldman, you know, the famous uh, anarchist, made a very catty remark. She said, she never was a communist. She slept with a communist. <laughs> and it's not quite the same thing. But uh, people who kept up with her uh, say that she never lost her zest for life. Her courage in the face of adversity was legendary by defying convention and demanding an equal place in a male-dominated world. She was a very big feminist, too. Louise proved that she was a genuine 20th century heroine, and we can take great pride in her. Next. Um, this is Sophie Delor. I, I wrote a biograph short biography of her in the booklet I wrote about Croton artists. Uh, they lived in Croton, and by the way, you can buy that in my gallery. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, one of, and I'll, I'll just read what I wrote because I, I can't really improve on it. <laughs> one of the most colorful artists to live in Croton, Sophie Villar, was not in the mold of the Bohemian radicals on Mount Airy. She arrived from Oregon and New York City where she found employment with George J. Gould, millionaire industrialist and son of the railroad magnate. Jay Gould. I was very discreet when I said found employment, <laughs> but we all know what that was. He, of course, <coughs> moved in the highest circles of New York society and was able to introduce her to everybody. Through Gould, she met many of the most prominent people of the day, forming an especially close bond with the Rockefeller family. Next, now here she is as a young woman. I see a glint in her eyes. Uh, she was determined to rise to the top. Next. Uh, and she could charm a bird off a tree, of course. Uh, next. This is her in a little older. Now, she was a photographer. 
She owned a photo studio in Rockefeller Center when it was first built because of her connections with the Rockefellers. And she uh, knew everybody who was anybody in society and then in show business and uh, the theater and so forth. She, uh, her clientele existed almost exclusively of society people and celebrities. For years, her studio provided yearbook photographs for the Seven Sisters Colleges and West Point. I brought one of her yearbooks here of Wellesley, and you can look at it. I think, didn't um, uh, Hillary uh, Clinton uh, go to Wellesley? She may be in the book. Um, it, in addition to her house in Croton, which was on Finney Farm, and studio in Manhattan, Miss DeLong maintained two splendid apartments on Fifth Avenue and one in Paris. It was there that she bought her Rolls Royce cabriolet from the Turkish ambassador. She regularly crossed the Atlantic on the Normandy and had her luggage stamped with her initials in gold. At one time, she had an oriental chauffeur butler who could be seen shopping at the Grand Union under her direction. <laughs> I saw her, she would go like this, and he took it and put it in the car. <laughs> uh, <laughs> she was said to winter in Monte Carlo. There had been at least one unhappy marriage and several romances, but at the age of 80, Miss DeLaw at last met the perfect companion in Bill Gibbons, manager of the Rolls-Royce Agency in New York. They were a couple married in Paris. Miss DeLaw lived on Finney Farm on the very top of the hill. She was singularly elegant, a captivating person, her accomplishments were many. She was an outstanding gourmet cook who entertained lavishly, preparing even the petit fours. She sold her own superb wardrobe, appearing always perfectly dressed in hat gloves, high heels, and chiffon scarves. Uh, I met her several times, and she was surely the most elegant woman in Croton. Today, next, next. Today, uh, now she took a portrait of the very young Nelson Rockefeller. Wasn't he handsome? And next. And help me with this. Is this the young Catherine Cornell? Or is this, who is this? <laughs> you know? Come on, all you. What year was this? Oh, this is this is from the thirties, twenties, thirties. It looks to me like the very young Catherine Cornell. Uh, next, <laughs> well, you know who that is. <laughs> I think she. That's a wonderful portrait. It looks so friendly. <laughs> next. Gertrude Stein. Next. Wonderful, wonderful fashion and beauty photos that she took. Uh, I, I just love that kind of thing. She took a lot of beautiful ads for department stores, garments and undergarments. And, uh, you know, there are few photographers who can match uh, this kind of skill and artistry. So we can be very proud of her. When she died, uh, the new people had uh, jitneys going up to uh, Finney Farm for three days in a row. And then I knew the woman who had bought the house 
And I asked her, could I come after the whole sale is over? And she said yes. So after all the silver and, and marble and antique furniture had been carted away, I, to my heart's content, went through her negatives, through her pictures, through her books that nobody wanted. And I even got some of her clothes, her handmade gorgeous clothes, which fit me exactly at that time. <laughs> I still have them, and here are, is a pair of her shoes. Last year, after uh, my talk, several people approached me and said, if you ever do this again, you must talk about Elizabeth Moose. And uh, I took that under advisement, and I did. So this is the story of Elizabeth Moose, although very little is known about her personal private life. Uh, and it, there just isn't anything that you can put your finger on. Um, very controversial person. Um, she appeared in the New York Times only twice in her life. Uh, once in 1951 when she was arrested, handcuffed, and taken away, a, a, along with the eminent uh, Dr. Uh, w. E. B. Du Bois, uh, accused of being an unregistered foreign agent. They had returned from a session in Stockholm. It was a peace uh, meeting engineered, I think, by the Soviets, and that's why our government was so upset and uh, the charges were dismissed. Uh, the, next, the only other time when she appeared in the Times was when she died. Her obituary, she lived to be quite an old lady, I think 94 or so. <coughs> but, but her radical, unbending politics that they were, is not why she was great. She was great because of her creative masterpiece, the Hessian Hill School. That was her creation, her ideas, and she carried it out, and she was the director for three decades. Next. Uh, well, this is her at the time of the arrest. Uh, let's go on to the next. This is her uh, with her then husband uh, in Croton. Uh, she and another woman, a neighbor, decided that they wanted a certain kind of education for their children. And uh, so they started a school first in a garage behind the house and quickly outgrew that and bought an old uh, farmhouse off Glengarry Road. Next. That's it. Uh, and eventually, uh, after that, uh, Burns down. They built uh, a beautiful new modern building uh, designed by the then famous uh, architect William Lescars, next, which is uh, now uh, Temple Israel. Um, now, there may be people in the audience who don't know very much about progressive education. The Hessian Hill School was one of a handful of such schools 
in this country, and it was one of the most imaginative, I think. Um, pe uh, people uh, want to say progressive education in a succinct, short way and say learning by doing. That is certainly correct, but it does not tell the whole story by any means. And I just wanted to say a few things to cue you in. Um, <coughs> children were allowed to have experiences of, of all different kinds that were real, not in the classroom. And much more was known about child psychology at the time when progressive education was enunciated by John Dewey and others in this country. It, the unfolding of a child's personality through the arts was a, a, a big idea in progressive education. Uh, working with others on common projects, uh, taking responsibility for oneself and others at an early age, seeing a task through to completion, to becoming a participating member of the group. The end result was, of course, becoming a participating citizen in a democracy. That is the end goal of progressive education. Uh, the Hesher Hill School was uh, particularly suited. It was a rural setting. Most of the other schools, like the Walden School, where my husband taught for 40 years, were in the city. And you had to go out in a park, you know, to get fresh air. But here, the children lived outdoors a great deal. They had animals, they built sheds and barns, they did farming, they planted fields, they had an orchard, and they took part in other management of the school, grounds, the library, lunchroom, and did real jobs, cleaning of the building and the outdoors. The learning was exciting, memorable. Um, the parents participated. They were part of the life of the school. And many parents moved to Croton so that their children could go to this school. Uh, I don't think there are any teachers still alive who taught them, but, but quite a few students are still with us. And I think there's some in the audience. There's one right there. <laughs> um, teachers, swarm from all over the United States to be on the staff. They wanted to be part of this exciting school. Um, the students who went there uh, all remember their days at the National School with great affection, but not more so than uh, wonderful James Stevenson, the cartoonist and writer of the New Yorker, who wrote marvelous books about growing up in Croton. He reminisced about, I have a copy there that you can look at. The Times had a column called Lost and Found New York. And this time it was James Stevenson this is toward the end of his life. I corresponded with him for many years. I tried to get him to come back here, but uh, unfortunately he died. Hessian Hills. This would be the time of year for a school reunion up at Hessian Hills if the old school had been that kind of place, but it wasn't. More likely it would have held a party with folk dances and balloons to celebrate the birthday of Samuel Gompers founder of the American Federation of Labor. By the late 20s, New York City had several progressive private schools, including Dalton, City and Country, the Little Red Schoolhouse, and I'm adding Walden. They were generally tolerated, but when residents of the small village of Croton-on-Hudson 
30 miles upriver from Manhattan, established a school based on liberal principles, it was not universally welcomed. One night, it burned to the ground. A modern school was built in its place. My older brother Eric enrolled when he was two. I joined when I was four and stayed until I was 12. From the start, we enjoyed an invigorating freedom. No grades were given, no tests were taken. Teachers were addressed by their first names. We never had to learn to write and script. Some of us still can't. <laughs> we improvised modern dance, waving silk scarves on bamboo poles. We read newspapers, including the Daily Worker. We knew about the Ford strike at River Rouge, where company thugs had <laughs> bloodied the strikers. We painted huge murals and put out plays. My part was the heartless banker evicting Okies in the dust bowl. <laughs> When I was nine, I wrote a letter to President Roosevelt urging him to lift the arms embargo on Spain to counteract the support that Franco was getting from Hitler and Mussolini. I don't remember an answer. The school took us to New York City to see a review called Pins and Needles, produced by the International Ladies' Garment Workers Union. The performers were all amateurs and members of the union. The show was also the largest running musical until Oklahoma came along. A stream near the school ran down into a small meadow. One day, near the end of the school year, a bunch of us took shovels and wheelbarrows and dug a ditch outlining the United States. Then we let the stream flood around it. We waded in the Gulf of Mexico, splashed around the Great Lakes, then climbed up the Rocky Mountains, feeling powerful, patriotic, and grand. The school didn't last. By 1951, the Korean War was on. My brother was in the Navy, and I was in the Marine Corps. Elizabeth Moose, a founder, and the head of the school had been pushed out for her leftist views and unyielding attitude. She was also indicted for failing to register as a foreign agent. Her crime, she had helped publicize the Soviet-sponsored Stockholm Peace Appeal <coughs> against nuclear weapons. The charge, charges were later, later dismissed. But blacklisting, character assassination, and later McCarthyism were on the rise. The school that had inspired and nourished us soon closed, there being no place for it in a season of fear. Uh, this was the uh, children's house, uh, an elegant uh, residence built uh, to house boarding students at the corner of Hessian Hills and Glengarry. Next. There on the far left is Elizabeth Moose in old age, still marching. This is with the women's strike for peace. <laughs> 